Welcome everyone to the February 8th City of Tualatin uh, City Council meeting. Thanks for joining us tonight via Zoom. Uh, we have several items on the, on the agenda, the agenda tonight. First thing up is our moment of silence for those who have lost their lives to COVID-19 led by Councillor Brooks. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to acknowledge the four, over 465,000 deaths that we have reached here in the United States and with special, special acknowledgement during February Black History Month of the disproportionate effects that this has had on black people and people of color. Um, I also wanna mention one of our city um, residents spoke to me a couple weeks ago discussing that she personally knew of five women who had lost their husbands to COVID. Um, not including me who lost a family member. And I just wanna think about this in a way that there's a lot of personal stories of loss and grief um, and other ways that people are grieving besides loss during these times of difficult economic and isolating times. Um, so please join with me in a moment of silence for those we've lost to COVID and those suffering. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, next item up is an announcement, the Employee of the Year for the City of Tualatin. Thank you, Mayor Bubenik. So oh. it's always an honor to present the Employee of the Year Award and this year even more so. Um, we all know what 2020 brought us starting just a little over a year ago today, a year ago, can you, believe it. Um, it. It seems hard to believe that we've been meeting virtually since the end of March and uh, just what last year brought us. So I do want to, you to know that I feel so incredibly proud of our organization. We literally sprang into action and none more so than Bates Russell and his information and maintenance services team. They were literally everywhere, all the time, for days, weeks, and months that felt like wow. decades. They procured laptops, Chromebooks, iPads out of thin air. They connected devices to our network. They transitioned us to a remote work environment almost overnight. And as you know, a sizable portion of our employees cannot work remotely including police and water, sewers, streets, and others that need to be on site. Bates and his team procured um, PPE, protective equipment. They installed HEPA filters. They found plexiglass. They built hand sanitizing stations and much more within days and hours. It was an impressive thing to watch. It, we've, it's been an analogy of like running a marathon at sprint pace. Bates and his team were the most supportive, dedicated group of employees I can ever imagine working alongside. Bates always has a smile, always has a joke or a meme. He's positive and energetic, always trying to find solutions. So the employee of the year are nominated by coworkers. So this isn't something that comes from me. It's from... Um, fellow co-workers and Bates received multiple nominations by individuals from across the organization at all levels. I want to personally and publicly thank Bates for everything he brings to the city of Tualatin and I am thrilled to present him as uh, to you as uh, Tualatin's 2020 employee of the year. Thank you so much, Sherilyn. I really appreciate it. It's uh, it's humbling, and I'm very grateful. And uh, as you said, you know, this is not an isolated thing. It, the, the the winning of this reflects really on the team, uh, and that's the IES team, the maintenance service team, the things that they did to to make this year uh, safe and accessible. Uh, but it's also the exec team, and we really came together as a group this year. 
uh, under your leadership with countless hours of meetings and countless hours of, of uh, policy uh, making and rewriting all with uh, in reaction to things that seem to change over overnight. Um, we have supported each other through this entire thing and, and with that mantra of keeping the public and the staff safe, uh, guiding us all the way. So you have good people here. Uh, I have not wanted to be anywhere else during this. Um, I get the irony of winning an award in possibly the worst year possible. So that's fitting to be tied to that for eternity. Uh, and again, like I said, I'm, I'm humbled and grateful. So thank you. Well, you've, uh, you've done a terrific job, Bates, uh, rolling with the, all the curveballs that were thrown at you and your staff over the year. Um, I very much appreciate your work uh, that you've done. You're always available to us as city uh, councilors and I believe um, to city employees. Uh, it's been a super challenging year um, for you and the IT folks as a IT person also that uh, when COVID hit and everybody started working from home, uh, a lot of us were working hours upon hours upon hours to make sure uh, people could continue to work. And that was super important for the city that residents saw that the city was continuing to work, was still on mission, and that still supporting our residents in um, getting sewer, water, police, all the services they rely on continue to function during this uh, very tough year. I just wanna thank you for everything you've done uh, to, assist the, to assist the city in getting this, uh, and doing it so well. Um, a lot, some of the cities struggled, uh, but uh, you and the management team uh, rolled with it, like I said before, and did an outstanding job. And, you know, I was joking with Sean before, it doesn't hurt that, you know, you're the guy doling out the eggs and the uh, hash browns at the holiday breakfast. So, you know, you, <laughs> you can make sure people are happy with in their stomachs too, in addition to getting the workload done. So uh, thank you for everything you've done. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I'm a man of many talents, right? <laughs> Does anyone else have anything to say for uh, Bates? Uh, Councilor Pratt and then Council President Grimes. Well, okay. I want to add that um, Sherilyn forgot to mention that you put together a pretty mean playlist too, but um, <laughs> um, also I just want to say, you know, every time I've needed your help and um, you're just always so kind and helpful and I really appreciate it. And it, it's just amazing what you've done this last year with um, handling things so quickly with the COVID and having to change everything. So thank you very much. We're really fortunate to have you. President Grimes. Well, I just want to add my thanks to everyone else's. Um, it's one thing to be a great leader, but I think one of the things that makes you such a good leader is your outstanding um, and fantastic attitude. And I think that the way that you've addressed the challenges this year and look for opportunities and used humor when appropriate to help make the best of some really difficult situations. I mean, you're just a joy to work with. And I think that that really helps the city and I think it helps our employees and I help, I think it helps ultimately to you know, it reaches out to the public and all the people that live here. And I just think that you are a very valuable resource and I congratulate you on the award. And um, I love working with you and your attitude is fantastic. So thank you for everything in an <laughs> insane year. Council Brooks. Thanks. I also want to acknowledge you. Um, I wrote in the chat, a champ among champs. The city's really risen to the occasion and for everyone to acknowledge you says so much. And for me, um, the few years that I've been on council, there was times that we missed you because of your own personal health challenges and you have been um, so kind and caring and dedicated throughout this whole process that I've known you. Um, 
And I think it's kind of funny that you're sitting there all by yourself at that place. It looks like you're in a timeout instead of being, I think we should fill it up with balloons <laughs> and celebrate. Anyway, I really appreciate all of your help. And I, oftentimes I feel like technology is not my first language and you make it since the very first day I came in talking about the maps and, and the computer setup and the whole bit um, have made it a lot easier for me to, uh, to cope in my role. And I'm sure that you're doing the same for everyone around you and your team. Thank you. Councilor Hillier. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Well, I'd like to offer a perspective of thanks on behalf of the community, because last year um, I was not on council, but I did have an opportunity to bring youth and um, other folks to speak at council and um, putting together videos and making sure that the community has the links that they need and going over and above. And I just feel like um, as now on the other side as, as a counselor, um, the respect that you um, just exude uh, to our community as well as um, we on council. And I, I'm sure um, your fellow staff people or you wouldn't have been nominated for so many levels, but I just really like to um, acknowledge that, that and, and say thank you. Um, you're um, so many, I could repeat things that have already been said, which would be silly, but I really do um, send you a heartfelt congratulations. And thank you for representing our city and um, helping us all feel connected. We appreciate you. Councilor Reyes. If I can unmute myself, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, um, Bates, thank you for all your hard work and thank you for being so patient and responsive every time I look for help on either emails or just anything that has to do with Mac. I know that you help with that. So thank you very much. And I just want to ditto everything what um, everyone said about you. And um, I will never forget the first time I met you. And then I we didn't see you for a little while. And I, I, I thought you left us and I'm like, why would he leave us? And then um, Sherilyn said, no, no, he should, he'll be back. And uh, so I was glad to see you um, recover from the health uh, hiccup that you had during that time. But thank you very much for your support. And thank you for always being so sweet and kind um, and not making me feel that I'm bothering you at all. So thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you all. I appreciate that. Congratulations again. Well deserved. And there's a proclamation that needs to be read. Oh, right. Gotta embarrass him some more. It gets to be read. It gets to read. All right. Who would like to read that proclamation? First hand up. Chelsea Pratt was first one out. <laughs> and have it right here. Okay. Proclamation declaring Bates Russell as Tualatin's 2020 Employee of the Year. Whereas the Employee of the Year program is designed to recognize the work and actions which bring credit to the city and improve our ability to deliver excellent service to Tualatin's customers and whereas Bates Russell joined the city of Tualatin as the Information Services Director in April of 2016 and has been an integral part of the organization and executive team from day one, and whereas 2020 was a year that brought so many challenges starting in March with the global pandemic, which resulted in the city of 12 organization reacting and responding on a variety of fronts simultaneously. From developing new policies and procedures to procuring personal protective equipment to outfitting employees with tools for remote work and so much more. Bates and the team in information and maintenance services were the heroes of the organization working to keep building software, equipment, and hardware running so that others could do their jobs. And whereas Bates worked tirelessly throughout 2020, a quote from one of the nomination letters says, there might be donuts in the counter and sure enough, it's Bates. Every now and then a masked man pokes his head in the door and says hello and asks how things are going and if I need anything. He is a thoughtful listener, provides positive solutions shares himself generously, and whereas Bates is unfailingly friendly and personable, he never fails to have a smile on his face or a funny meme to share, no matter what the crisis he is dealing with, and 
whereas Bates consistently demonstrates to Alton's core values of teamwork, respect, having one city mindset, empowerment, problem solving, customer service, and being non-bureaucratic in a multitude of ways every day. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed in the city, by the city council of the city of Tualatin, Oregon, that Bates Russell is named the 2020 Tualatin Employee of the Year. Introduced and adopted this eighth day of February, 2021. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Pratt. All right. So moving on, uh, public comment. So public comment is an opportunity for anyone to address the council regarding an item that is not on tonight's agenda. Please keep your comments to about three minutes. If there's anyone attending the Zoom meeting here who would like to address the council, this would be the appropriate time. Is there anyone at the poll center, Bates? Uh, negative, Mayor. There's Megan and myself. All right. Uh, Nicole, have you, is there, are you aware of anybody who wanted to make public comment? I have received none in writing. I missed that? I received no requests in writing. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Nancy, it wasn't just me. Nancy was like, huh? <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, you don't have to be registered anything. I'm just looking around, seeing any hands up in the Zoom meeting or I'm seeing none. All right. So we'll then move on to the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda are items considered routine and will be adopted by one motion unless someone on the council would like one of them removed and heard separately later tonight. We have only two items on the consent agenda tonight. First being consideration of approval of the city council work session and regular meeting minutes of January 25th, 2021. And item number two, consideration of resolution number 5340-21 authorizing the city manager to sign amendments to the Intergovernmental Agreement, or IGA, for library services between the city of Tualatin and Washington County. Would anybody like any, would any counselor like an item removed for consent? All right. I move that we accept the consent agenda as read. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as read. Any discussion on the motion? I see none. Councilor Brooks. Aye. Councilor Sacco. Aye. Councilor Hillier. Aye. Councilor Reyes. Yes. Councilor Pratt. Aye. Council President Grimes. Aye. And I vote aye also. It's unanimous on the item. Thank you. Uh, moving on to public hearings, I uh, have, uh, is Sean going to address, there's a mistake here about being quasi-judicial. Uh, do you want to just talk about that for a second since we had that work session just recently? Yeah. You bet, you bet. So yes, this is a, a legislative land use item, so it's not quasi-judicial. This applies, this would amend the uh, comprehensive plan and um, as well as some code related to the stormwater master plan. So that applies citywide. So that is uh, legislative and not quasi-judicial. All right, thank you. So item number one in public hearing is consideration of ordinance number 1453-21 related to the plan text amendment or PTA 21-0001, adopting an updated stormwater master plan 2019 for the city of Tualatin and updating comprehensive plan policies and relevant development code references to reflect the updated plan. I believe we'll hear from staff to begin with. And I see Tabitha and I see Steve. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening. We're actually gonna turn it over to our community development director, Kim McMillan, to walk right. you through tonight's presentation and staff report. Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. We're gonna start with the stormwater video that staff prepared. We use that for public outreach and at our virtual open house in December. So I think Tabitha is going to cue that up and then I'll work us through a PowerPoint. The City of Tualatin has been working on a new stormwater master plan that we'll use to guide our planning and spending over the next 10 years. Stormwater is water that originates from rain, but it also includes ice and snowmelt. 
Stormwater runoff happens when rainfall that does not soak into the ground flows over land or impervious surfaces, such as paved streets, parking lots, and rooftops. When it rains, and as stormwater washes over these surfaces, it can pick up oil, sediment, bacteria, grease, and chemicals that can pollute our streams and the Tualatin River. Too much stormwater can also have impacts on humans and the environment, including flooding, eroding stream banks, property loss, and clogging of waterways that can kill fish and other aquatic animals. To manage stormwater in Tualatin, the city has a network of about 93 miles of pipes and structures that collect and safely move stormwater from one location to another. Unlike sanitary sewer water, the stormwater collected in these systems discharges directly into the nearest water body. So, locally, this would be Hedges, Nyberg, or Somme Creek, Tualatin River, or it could even be one of the many wetlands we have throughout the community. To reduce the impacts of stormwater pollution, the city also manages roughly 500 public and private water quality. quality facilities that collect stormwater runoff from our residential, commercial, and industrial areas. These facilities are designed to clean, treat, and detain stormwater before it enters back into the environment. They help reduce pollution, erosion, help protect our environment, and you might find one of these near your home or near your place of work. Some of the issues addressed in the Stormwater Master Plan include aging infrastructure, capacity issues with undersized pipes, planning for future growth, erosion of our stream banks from uncontrolled discharge, adding new and repairing old water quality facilities, prioritizing projects in areas at risk, and ensuring our maintenance crews and program stay on budget. Here is an example of a site in Tualatin where erosion is eating away at the stream bank, undercutting the hillside above. Stormwater collected from a large area upstream is sent through a network of pipes that help give this creek its beginnings. Unfortunately, those pipes move the stormwater very quickly, and that fast-moving flow is taking its toll on the side of this creek. As we can see, the pipe coming from the neighborhood area above is being exposed and starting to fail. Repairing this site is one of the many projects identified in the Stormwater Master Plan. Tualatin values its natural spaces and environmental systems, and we believe protecting and supporting these ecosystems is important for maintaining a livable and healthy city. This means taking care of and managing our stormwater system. So, while keeping the budget in mind, the Stormwater Master Plan identifies dozens of projects intended to expand, repair, or enhance our current stormwater system. The city will use this document as a guide for planning projects and for keeping our stormwater program running smoothly. Thank you, Tabitha. That was our own Hayden Oslin. He's one of our engineers at the city. And I'm gonna share my screen with our PowerPoint. So we started the storm plan, stormwater master plan effort in 2016, and that was done to help guide us through the stormwater capital project and program uh, decisions for the next 10 years, as Hayden mentioned. Almost 50 years ago, that was the plan that was in place. So this one is now up to date, and it refers to the regulations that we um, treat our stormwater under. Again, it's to look at the built infrastructure in the city of Tualatin and the improvements that are needed. Um, we've got pipes that might be need to be replaced or upsized. You saw the pipe hanging out over the creek. That is a retrofit project for outfalls and that is mandated through DEQ and Clean Water Services uh, and their co-implementers, which we are one, try to do so many of those projects a year to meet our requirements of those permits that we hold with DEQ. The stormwater plan isn't specific in every regulation, but it does reference all the regulations we're under. And 
this all stems from the 1972 Clean Water Act. It comes down to us through the state of Oregon and because engineers love their acronyms, the NPDES permit, which is the National Pollution Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. It gets to Clean Water Services. They have a permit with DEQ and that's the MS4 permit, Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System Permit. And we are a co-implementer. That means we have an agreement with Clean Water Services to adhere to those standards and guidelines for all stormwater development in the city. And it's what allows us to discharge stormwater to the waters of the United States. They're more stringent than they were even in 2016, but because of our IGA, we have those in place and all development that's occurring now and plan will fall under those regulations. Stormwater, I think the video showed clearly what stormwater is from the precipitation and that it picks up these sediments and oils and then it gets to our uh, ponds and streams and rivers. And so the focus was on water quality and uh, quantity improvements, again, in our built system. So here's a map that shows 21 projects throughout the city of Tualatin to help improve stormwater system and water quality. It's about $12 million worth of work over 10 years. It's it's a big list and it's just a plan. There are some more uh, projects there that are prioritized over the others, but they aren't in a priority order at this time. I think it'll be a response again to how the city's goals are shaped through council and through development. But even those prioritized uh, projects are $6 million. So planning for future growth, we. We didn't look at future development areas because stormwater is so dependent on the specific development on the table. Um, you'll see a site come in and they lay out the infrastructure, which would be the street alignments, the uh, corridors for storm, water, and sewer. And then they're going to look at their topography. Where does it make sense to put a pond? And it's going to be a large pond because of the um, more stringent stormwater requirements for discharge. So the city did not identify capital projects in these future development areas because it's expected that the devel developers would pay for those projects. Again, following all those rules and regulations that we already have in place. So with that being said, um, this plan didn't address those future areas because we had a master plan that's almost 50 years old and we need to get caught up with that and we are talking to our partner agency, Clean Water Services, about what we can do um, a sub-basin analysis that would include Basalt Creek. And they're the experts on stream evaluations. So partnering with them would be a really good thing. I'm gonna stop sharing in case you have questions here, but then Tabitha will pick it up with a little bit of the um, comp plan issues. Questions so far for Kim. Council Brooks. Um, thanks for the presentation. The video is very informative as well. And um, I guess, I guess there's a couple questions. How, how is the new regulations more strict than the other. Um, can I just give you three questions or do you want to do one at a time? No, you can give me three. I'll, tr I'll try to remember. Okay. You can remind me. Okay. Um, that was my first question. I understood that Washington County now is doing new measurements from the air around uh, waters and uh, streams. And I'm just wondering if that's part of what we're doing. And then the third, I attended an amazing um, free seminar. I forget the organization, it was a government organization about um, water, I think they call it, no, rain gardens. And they talked about when we plan a rain garden, it was easy math because you measure the roof and 10% of the, of the roof is the area of the rain garden. 
So I'm just curious um, when we kind of have an estimate about how many impervious surfaces there are, why that's a difficult thing to plan for, or I don't know if I'm thinking about too high level or too simplistically, but I'm just curious if we have those kinds of like, is it a 10%? Um, are we thinking of things that are a little bit more, uh, you know, not 1970s, like things like rain gardens? Um, are there guidelines that we help with builders? Those are the kinds of questions that come up for me. Thank you. Okay, let me try to tackle some of those. First, the more stringent standards that are in place, and they were being worked on and adopted while we were doing the same effort with the master plan. And it's the um, <laughs> hydro modification. And I only say that because I know I have to explain what it is. <laughs> and it is more stringent detention standards that are normal detention standards you hold a quantity of water on site, you release it through an orifice and a pipe so it's a small opening so that the downstream impacts are not any greater than before they built 100 homes or whatever the development is. So the hydro modification goes one step further and says, we want to control those smaller, more frequent storms that are very flashy and they cause a lot of erosion in our streams. So that's really the focus of the hydro modification standard. So it's to, to get at that um, and prevent that erosion. So what happens because of that is instead of a pond that's you know um, as big as maybe two home lots, it's as big as four or six home lots now. It's, it's mm -hmm. that large because they have to hold back even more stormwater runoff. So that's the first question. I'm not sure what the county is doing. I'm assuming they're using drones to uh, do some mapping. And I know that Clean Water Services is also using those drones to do mapping. Um, I don't know the specifics of the county project, but that's what, if there was basin analysis done like a sub basin, uh, those would probably be employed by Clean Water Services as well to do that um, initial review of What's they're going doing, on? The they're doing an entire project with planes, actually. Oh, with and, planes. Yeah. Well, and, a lot of times that you know they've done topography that way. That's aerial topography that they'll do. Yeah, they call it, I think Liberian. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what project they're doing that for. Um, the seminar you're talking about, rain gardens. Uh, we've been doing rain gardens for, gosh, I don't know, a, over a decade or more. I know that I did them in Portland 30 years ago, practically, but we do have those in the toolbox of clean water services standards and it's low impact development and they call it LIDA. And so those are encouraged like on a single family lot that just one home comes in or maybe there's two homes, but in a subdivision, it's much more efficient to do a large facility. You get both detention and water quality out of the ponds. The city maintains those, those are uh, public systems. And say the ones um, for large subdivisions are more like a regional system. They function better, they provide better wildlife habitat. They can be used as amenities for parks or you know, for even if it's just their neighborhood park. But the, the rain garden is for basically water quality treatment of like a single family lot. Yeah, and I guess my question was, was more about the math of impervious surfaces because when they were teaching it, they were saying, well, you do 10% of the hard surfaces and that's how much. And so I was just curious if that's a kind of, if there's any kind of projections that we do, even though we're not doing specific direction for the developers, if we have these sort of math standards around those kinds of impervious surfaces, and how much drainage we want. And then I guess the other question I have as far as sitting water and not draining like shallower is um, around, you know, in the seventies when they designed these rules, there were a lot less toxic chemicals as well. And so as far as water filtration for uh, glyph like glyphosates, you know, um, different kinds of chemicals that we're finding now, the tires, um, 
there's the new study out that uh, kills the fish, um, those kinds of things. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, are we um, looking at filtration? Like, how are we looking at filtration with all of the chemicals and the lack of, uh, we just have so much less habitat than we had. Right. Well, the math that you're talking about, the 10%, that's a simplified method. And again, it would be for if somebody just came in and they wanted to build a patio in their backyard, or if they had a single lot and they wanted to build. But for these large subdivisions, they have to capture runoff from the streets, and then they count each lot, and they have to do detention. So the math is a model that's it's fairly complicated because they have to go through the two-year storm, the five-year, the 10 and the 25, and model it to have the basically what's coming into the pond and out of the pond balanced so that there's no impact downstream. So there's for that portion of it, there's no easy math to be done. It's a model that's pretty complicated. And usually you have one person in your department who can run it. So that's that piece of it. And Clean Water Services developed that um, with the city of Tigard when they were doing River Terrace, but they implemented it for then the whole district. And then the same thing with the water quality, those standards come out of Clean Water Services and the work that they do with DEQ. If there's special things that need to be removed and we know about it, then we would work with uh, Clean Water Services and their source control group. Okay, yeah, I'm just assuming there's a lot because I just, the way the landscaping is here, there's, there would be a lot. So but that's, those are my questions. Thank you very much. Other questions for Kim? Council Pratt. Hi, Kim, thank you for the presentation. Um, I guess my questions, I wanna understand a little more about the Basalt Creek area. And I, I get that like, um, you know, at each development or area that's being developed, um, we don't know how they're going to grade the land and what the stormwater runoff. What I'm wondering is, um, as we go down the line, um, as multiple properties get developed, is there a point where you have to look at them all in combination, or can you really um, see stormwater in each individual property as being contained on that property, or does it kind of multiply and have to be addressed? level as it develops um, more and more out there? Well, I, typically what will happen is each subdivision will have to address its own needs. And so what we're seeing with the two proposals on the east side of Boone's Ferry Road is uh, two ponds. And when they first started out together, there was one pond. But what I think was exciting about the latest plan I saw was a large area on the Pennington property to handle stormwater, which tells me they've started to do the calculations for this more stringent standards, which requires a larger pond, which gets to a greener, you know, um, pond and it could be more trees and it could be benches. And so it could become that amenity within a subdivision to provide for those um, new residents. Oh, nice. And then um, as far as the master plan, since there's nothing to put a master plan around at this point, where will, will that occur after that whole area is developed and you know what's out there? Or once typically where you look at adding that to the master plan? Right. That's a good question. That, uh, again, when I talked to Andy Braun at Clean Water Services, because they review the master plan as well, they want to make sure our master plan is not in conflict with the overarching district plan. He said that they are looking at some sub basin work, and that might be one of them. And Wilsonville's just picked up their master plan work and started it. And so it might be in conjunction since ours will flow down to Wilsonville is to have some partnering. But again, it'll be driven by the developments and those drivers. And as our consultant mentions, pressures that are put on by development will have to address some of those things. It may get to a point where they point out uh, their development can't support those improvements, but we can't allow them to move forward. So I think, you know, we could see that happen, but it's not going to be right out of the gate. Well, it could be. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Oh, Kristen, sorry. Hey,
just to piggyback on what Councillor Pratt said, um, so with the um, you know update of new developments going in, but in general, then is this to be like a living document that is meant to change with standards over time? So we're not left with uh, sort of this 50, this 50 year old um, plan, but something that um, won't be out of date as soon as it's implemented. You should go call the dog. <laughs> I was really hoping I'd make it through a meeting. <laughs> um, yeah, well, a living document, not exactly, but they are expected to be updated about every 10 years. So we're only about 40 years behind on this one and I'm more hopeful on the next one. But I think especially as the standards continue to become uh, more environmentally focused, we would take another look at it if there was a big plan. But again, we adopt whatever Clean Water Services has. We agreed to implement that and they're the experts. Other questions for Kim? See you now. I guess we segue to you, Tabitha. Now, uh, yes. Hello, uh, Tabitha Boschetti, Assistant Planner with the Planning Division. I've got a, the rest of this presentation for us this evening. Um, and there was one last bit. So, of course, I think we've touched on a few of these uh, general concepts, um, but we wanted to highlight that throughout the process of updating the stormwater master plan, um, our engineering division did hold a virtual open house and was able to begin some of the conversations um, with community members um, about important concerns. And that has also continued, of course, as we also look at our plan text amendment, uh, which is part of the overall package that we are bringing you this evening. Um, and so yeah, some of you who've been keeping score at home uh, may recall that in the past, um, we have sometimes brought to you a background technical document. Step one, acknowledge the document. Step two, actually incorporate it into our comprehensive plan, which is the policy big picture document for a lot of our development activity. Um, we're bringing you an all in one this evening. Um, and so the plan text amendment portion of the overall proposal we're talking about tonight uh, includes updating uh, what is now chapter nine of our comprehensive plan that involves our public facilities policies. Um, a lot of those are fairly consistent with what has what you'd see there today. Um, but bringing in some updated language, um, correctly referring to the partners that we work with um, as a city, um, and as well as a few opportunities to clarify language, particularly around, you know, we have something in there that's like, you got to do the stormwater thing, and we're getting a lot more detailed than saying who does it, when they do it. Um, it's the same essential policy, um, but updated with greater clarity. And at this point, I do also want to emphasize that while our big picture policy document is broaching that half century mark, there have been incremental changes to our development code to acknowledge some of those more updated things that we've learned about stormwater. Um, so of course, in uh, tonight's packet as well, um, you'll see that there is a collection of findings and analysis uh, regarding that plan text amendment. Um, and so that needs to address statewide planning goals, regional goals, as well as, of course, our own policies, you know, showing that this is in the public interest and something that council would want to advance. Um, and so with that, um, we're bringing you the overall ordinance 1453-21, which both approves the stormwater master plan and the contents that are in it, and then also bringing that in to our policy framework and all of the ways that that trickles down into our broader collection of policies. Um, we did bring this to the Tualatin Planning Commission last month. Um, they considered mostly the plan text amendment portion um, and forwarded on a recommendation of approval. Um, we bring that to you now, um, though of course this is now where council can 
deliberate and we respectfully recommend recommend, recommend approval. Um, though of course we understand that you may wish to make modifications, deny, continue the conversation and we welcome your questions from here. Ah, though I will say that we have some additional next steps that will happen after tonight um, because there will still be operational issues to address and of course, funding, um, which will still be exciting sequels to look forward to after tonight. I will stop the share of that. Thank you very much. I like the smile you gave with the funding. That's always the, that's the fun, like I said, that's always the fun part. The planning is the easy part. Funding is the tough part. Uh, questions for Tabitha? All right. Council Brooks. I had questions. Um, can you talk about, is there any, we talk about diverting water, but is there any conversations around trees um, in this plan too? Uh, one of the things that was mentioned at the annual meeting of the Twelton River Keepers is that the river is like about a degree too high and um, and then I know that trees are part of um, helping with erosion, helping with um, uh, soil, helping with filtration and helping with cooling off things. So it's not just the Tualatin River, obviously, it's all of our streams and rivers. So I'm just curious if that has any part of, and at the same time, I know roots can get in with the rest. I'm just curious about um, trees in the plan. Uh, I will take that one. I, I'm not sure that it addresses trees specifically. However, um, some of the stream health issues are around trees and it is for shading the waters. I know that I've had to have projects plant trees in those areas for that purpose. And that's a reason why you have parking lot trees because the asphalt gets so hot and the runoff is you know, hot from the asphalt. That's one of the reasons, but um, it's not like there's a specific project in there that is tree spe you know, specific, I guess. Yeah, I just think about, especially with, with new development, um, how we manage our trees. And I think there's also um, direction around tree management from the county. And do we sit underneath that or From the county, not you know, not on our city streets. It's under the Clean Water Services standards, and so we would have street trees as well along our new streets and our existing streets as development occurs. And we often um, also on county facilities we would have a say in getting streets planted along there, and that also helps with the runoff. Okay. I, yeah, I'm think, I guess I'm thinking more about trees around water, around the places that we're diverting water and um, around protecting water and the erosion piece. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's about preservation of trees and, you know, just trying to maintain a canopy and um, as much as we can. And if we're thinking about that, um, and if that fits into this conversation, um, you know, I know we talk a lot about pipes and diversion, um, but I just feel like it would be a proactive thing that um, some kinds of preservations could be um, very efficient and effective and cost us less money in the long run too. And I think it more closely fits into our urban forestry program that um, of course is coming up, Arbor, Arbor Week is coming up and that whole program and getting Tree City USA for the last 33 years. Um, and that has a whole list of criteria that does include preservation and, um, and how it uh, prevents runoff. And then layered on top of that, Clean Water Services has a program called Tree for All where they, the plan is to plant a million trees um, over the next 10 years, I believe. And we're, we work with Friends of Trees 
and have a very vital program with them uh, to plant trees along the stream beds, along the, the Tualatin River um, with Clean Water Services and Friends, for Tree, Friends of Trees um, that has to do with keeping the water cool. And um, yeah, and we're under all kinds of regulations around the, the river you know, no development and planting of trees and clean water services is super um, on top of development around the river for sure. So I guess my question around that then is how is the how are those things coordinated? And and then the second question is not just the shading and everything, but also carbon sequestration. And we do um, what would I say? We're I don't know how we do the tree management. I'm curious around when we, there was a lot of conversation around trees, for instance, with um, the, some sub, sub uh, development discussions that we've had in the past around Basalt Creek and concern from uh, citizens there. And so I guess those are the kinds of questions that come up for me, not just street trees, but when we're taking trees out, how do we balance that with our tree um, program that you're talking about, Sherilyn, and I think that, and how does it all coordinate with the plan that you're, um, that Kim and, and Tabitha are, are telling us about? Because it feels like very related and, um, and sometimes I get concerned because not in this situation, I just don't know how it works, but I've seen situations where things can get siloed and then they're less effective. So I'm just curious about the way that it inter interrelates with each other. So can I just add the um, Clean Water Services, when we have a project come in, they have to provide a service provider letter and they talk about sensitive areas. And one of the big things that Clean Water Services regulates is the vegetated corridor. So that's the areas along those streams and creeks those have to be brought up to a standard and usually they're degraded when somebody comes in to develop. So they would have to add native plantings and trees along that corridor. And one of the main goals of that would be to shade the corridor. Thank you very much. And then I guess the second question with that is some of those trees are right by the freeway, which also protects people that live near freeways from a lot of those toxins and stuff like that. So. Is it a similar conversation with that? I mean, it's not quite a street tree conversation, but it's definitely a corridor of pollution conversation. I was gonna add that there, there might be a bigger conversation here as well, because to the point where, you know, how does this all interact, right? So like a lot of cities that I've seen or like my past experience with a different city, um, in some cases, it's done more as an environmental overlay. Um, Tualatin does have some environmental overlays where there are mapped natural resources. And in some case that, cases, that does include our riparian areas. Um, but it's also the case that, you know, are our environmental overlay standards where you would want them? Um, do they function to the degree that council would desire? that might be a larger conversation. Um, there are certainly some cities that do things like, if you're doing a subdivision, you have to save X percent of trees by this particular formula. That's not something that we necessarily have here. Um, we do lean on clean water services, um, who I believe is particularly concerned with a lot of those water-based resources, and that probably has the greatest intersection with tonight's conversation that's really focusing on a lot of those more infrastructural questions. Um, and then you have like what they call the upland resources that are farther away from a direct water body. Um, and in those cases, the, you know, there's, there's a relationship there, but I don't know that I could speak to it quite as clearly. That's helpful, thank you. I don't know if Steve has anything to add to that too. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that those are, those are good points. I mean, I think the coordination is clean water services. And I think that that preservation of vegetated corridors is the piece where environmental regulations and stormwater do interact. And I think that we haven't seen, I think, a site that's been developed under the vegetated corridors since the hydro modification rules that Kim 
referred to have come into place. So my understanding from a presentation put on by Clean Water Services that I attended is, is that um, because of the erosion impacts of tree removal, that um, in order to comply with hydro modification, that developments in the future would be re re credited for essentially uh, greater tree retention, um, potentially even upland trees that were outside of the vegetated corridor for that reason. Um, and so I think those are those are good things. The, the one bit of good news about your comment on the freeway trees is that um, at least some of them are within the ODOT right of way um, along I-5. And so those would be retained um, because they're not on private property. But um, yeah, I think the overall question about um, tree retention and removal is, is has some bearing on this conversation, but is probably a good topic for us to explore at a later date if desired. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Council raised his hand up. I did, but a lot of the questions were kind of answered. My questions were answered as people were, I'm like, oh, I'm going to ask that. Oh, well, it just clarified it. So, I mean, just, well, maybe one question. Do you, um, are you, uh, um, Kim and your team, are you expecting us to, um, to review the, to, to give you a recommendations on what else to move on or do you, I think I, I guess I'm wondering what what we is, what is needed of us or specifically, uh, you know, what do you, what can we do for you? What, how can we help or what do you want us to do? Or I guess that's, that's my question. I understand the whole concept of clean water services and why they work and what you guys do this and how we work together. So I just wanted to know that if there's, I don't know what you want, what would you like for us to do for you? <laughs> or at least me. Council Reyes, we're talking about the plan text amendment. That's what we're gonna. Is that what we're, okay, fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. All right. I just, I'm listening, so. No, all right. Uh, any other questions? Cause I, would, I do wanna open up the public just, uh, comment. All right, so no questions at this time. So I do see uh, Grace and John Lucini uh, here at the Zoom meeting, and I assume you do want to speak. So uh, if you could limit your comments to three minutes, would be appreciated. Hey, Ms. Bucky. Hi, um, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciated hearing the questions about the Basalt Creek because obviously that's uh, a prime interest to us. Um, being that we're two citizens presenting related testimony, I was wondering if the council will allow us to, to combine our three minutes into a six minute quest, uh, question time. Sure. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, we are John and Grace Uccini, our home and residence and properties at 23677 Southwest Boone's Ferry Road, Twalton, Oregon. During the uh, Twalton Planning Commission meeting on 12, uh, uh, January 21st, 2021, the commissioners forwarded an unanimous approval only for the proposed changes to the te plan text amendment. The Planning Commission did not address the functionality or provide recommendations regarding the proposed Brown and Caldwell 2019 draft. While we provided our concerns about the lack of a stormwater management plan during the Basalt Creek Comprehensive Plan, we have also presented, um, submitted three written testimonies starting December 15, 2020, regarding the proposed uh, 2019 master plan update, and also provided verbal testimony to the Planning Commission on tw uh, January 21st, 2021. The information contained within these submissions should be within the city's uh, records. Having reviewed the two, uh, proposed two, uh, 2019 update and knowing our limitations, we also hired a well-qualified environmental engineer familiar with the Basalt Creek area to review and comment upon the entire uh, Brown and Caldwell document and its uh, technical data. A report, uh, his report dated 1-14-2021 uh, and a copy of his prior hydraulic model modeling reports conducted within the Basalt Creek portion of the uh, the northeast portion of the Basalt Creek area were attached to our extensive citizen comments submitted to the city on December 15th. Based on the engineer's findings, which in included comments about outdated materials, inconsistencies, and omissions of uh, uh, substantial uh, portions of analysis needed for a stormwater management plan for the Basalt Creek area, and our own uh, personal uh, experience of having stormwater flooding our property from the current system within the Basalt Creek area in 2015. We understand the need for a stormwater management plan for the Basalt Creek area, which includes all the requirements 
on elements of, uh, for public services and facilities as specified by AOR chapter 660 and summarized by the State Department of Environmental Equality in their publications on the requirements for municipal stormwater planning. The city has, uh, has none of the requirement to ensure the provision of this key public service and public facilities for the Northern Passaic Creek area since 2004. In 2016, the city staff, a member responded to our email asking about the professional services contract for the Brown and Caldwell stormwater Ma uh, master plan update. His uh, in the comments included the city's intent to have the Basalt Creek area included in the Brown and Caldwell contract to evaluate, quote, uh, water hydrology, hydraulics in the Basalt Creek planning area and to allow the city to uh, better plan for future infrastructure needs by understanding how much runoff to expect and anticipating where the run runoff flow uh, will flow based on the existing topography and possible future land uses. He also added that including this work in the contract would allow the city to save money versus creating a future separate document just for the planning area. This information is not apparent in the current draft of the Brown and Codwell uh, update. The city's approach to relying upon individual developers within the Basalt Creek area to manage stormwater on site in their pro projects, if feasible, does not provide for a cohesive integrated stormwater management plan for the entire Basalt Creek area in areas which have limited offsite options. The city's approach for stormwater management is not consistent with Oregon's land use planning goal number 11 for uh, public services and facilities, which says, uh, their summary is the goals set a central concept for uh, public services should be planned in accordance with a community's needs and capacities, rather than be forced to respond to the development as it occurs. The proposed draft does not include clear mechanisms to address for the coordination of public services by Washington County, who currently provides this public service through their limited uh, system and facilities in the Basalt Creek area, uh, area, which are designed for undeveloped lands. The map within the, uh, the uh, draft are outdated or do not correctly identify clearly uh, uh, the 300 to 400 uh, acre of uh, coming the 300 acres within the Basalt Creek lands, which are within the city's planning area. The proposed master plan update uh, date maps do not clearly identify the 60 acres in the northeast portion of the Basalt Creek area, which is the city is already uh, annexed into the city limits and which should be uh, have identified in the documents in this, uh, the city's boundaries. The outdated and now inaccurate maps within the uh, update to a major land use master plan for the city will immediately conflict with the city's uh, master plans and governing documents, which is on contrary to the land use planning goals. The proposed ma stormwater master plan does not address capacity issues, erosion control needs within an area with uh, uh, significantly steep so uh, slopes, the Basalt Creek Canyon and downstream wetlands or make recommendation on any capital improvements for stormwater management caused by the anticipated development within the Basalt Creek area. While the city has been aware of multiple natural resources which exist in this Basalt Creek area, city maps 721 and 723 lack identification of multiple known natural resources, including gold fire resources within the Basalt Creek area. This is problematic for the compliance of this proposed land use action to goal five objectives, as well as any other land use of actions by the city within which the impact the Basalt Creek area. We request the city of Tualatin Council to return this first public draft of the proposed land use stormwater management ba uh, plan back to the staff to address and provide the required elements for a city storm man water management planning for the Basalt Creek area. The area, the city has already annexed large areas of land and have other use, uh, have other use land development con under consideration within, within the Basalt Creek area. As citizens and downstream property owners, we'd appreciate your assistance in the timely development of a safe, effective stormwater management master plan for the Basalt Creek area, which meets or exceeds state requirements. We appreciate your time and consideration of these issues we have presented to the, uh, the city and the council over many years relating to the need for a safe, effective stormwater management uh, program for the Basalt Creek area. Uh, in our comments submitted on 2-5 of uh, 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 February 5th, last Friday, we submitted to the council 
I'll request to address five uh, specific questions we, we included on in our communication. And we uh, request that the council would address those and provide us a copy of the uh, staff responses uh, at, as well as their um, uh, when and how and what re resolutions they came up with. Um, and we appreciate a copy of that staff report. We appreciate your time and we appreciate you listening to us. All right. Thank you, Grace. Um, any other public comment, either in the poll center or here in the meeting? Uh, no one at the poll center, Mayor. I'm not seeing any hands coming up from the folks in the Zoom meeting here. All right, so I'll go back to uh, Steve, Kim, and Tabitha on uh, maybe addressing some of the comments from Grace and John. Is there something specific that you would like to start off on or broadly? Um, I'm, I guess, so folks know the, um, I know staff has been working with uh, Grace and John over the last few weeks and they've uh, addressed, uh, I believe that there was a 90 page document sent by the Lucinis uh, and I'm, I believe st uh, staff uh, responded to that. There are staff responses to um, their comments within your packet. Mm -hmm. um, some of the concerns, I think, were the coordination with Washington County. And that we do with every development that comes in that is um, adjacent to a county facility. And so they have input on our land use process from the very beginning for pre-apps. So we do coordination there. Um, trying to think what else was listed. The, the planning, as we mentioned, we didn't take a look at uh, Basalt Creek at this time. So we needed to get a master plan done and uh, catch up. And then we can look at future development areas later. Um, and it's gonna be driven by those developments. And for consistency, each one of them, you know, has to adhere to those same clean water services standards, which includes looking at the downstream analysis to determine if there are existing problems and to ensure that they don't have more impact on the downstream system. All right. All right. Uh, Chris, you have your hand up or I can't tell. <laughs> all right. So I like part of your hand up. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you. Any uh, questions or discussion on this PTA by council? Council Pratt. I just want to ask if, um, they had, um, Martinis had five specific questions. Were these addressed or will these be addressed directly to them or responded to? I think maybe the question for the council is, is that there's, we're in the hearing now, we can certainly do our best to orally answer those questions, but to the extent that the council chooses to close the hearing, then there would be no, no formal response after that um so i guess that that would be that would be our question i think is would, would the council like us to try to walk through those five questions and answer them orally um well i would but i'm not i'm one person here i just had a question are you saying that we're in the hearing right now yeah we have been Oh, we, I, I didn't realize we started the hearing. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm so used to that other way that we start a hearing. I thought we were doing a public- yeah, this is legislative, not quasi-judicial. I see, sorry. Um, thank you. I'm, I'd like to hear the answers as well. I think it's a really important conversation and um, in my mind, the topography there is so steep the basalt rock is so hard. There's so much trickiness to it um, that sometimes I get concerned about um, how much developers know compared to you guys and clean water services and things like that. So, um, so I think it's worth, for me, it's worth talking about as well, um, like uh, Councillor Pratt. 
So I guess the question I would have for Steve is, um, are you really prepared to answer the five questions tonight or no? I mean, because we don't want you to wing it, we want you to be complete and uh, be able to give the best answers you can. So uh, how do you feel about where you're at with answering some of these questions tonight? You know, I mean, I think that some of them are a little bit technical. I, I, I'll I, defer to Kim. I mean, I think that um, some of them might benefit from the opportunity for us to develop a written response to them. Sean, it's, oh. do you have a do you have any thought there legally? I mean, I uh, I do have legal thoughts. I, I would, uh, yeah. I mean, I, if you're asking for advice, we'd have to go into executive session to talk about that advice and some of the issues raised, the legal issues raised. So I wouldn't want to discuss those in a session. But um, certainly answering the questions. I mean, you know. Um, if the council wants that to occur, then I think, you know, postponing the hearing to allow staff to do so makes sense. That's President Grimes. Yeah, that was going to be my suggestion is that we should maybe continue the hearing to another date certain so that it gives staff time to prepare a thoughtful response to the questions that were raised, because I know I'm interested in hearing the outcome also, but it doesn't sound like we're prepared tonight to, um, you know, tackle them to the depth that we as counselors might want to have the answer. So I'd like to make a motion that we continue the hearing. Okay. So I have a motion to continue the hearing mm -hmm. on uh, ordinance number 1453-21. Uh, Charlene. Yes. Well, I, I, I don't want to contradict anything that's been said here by the staff, but I guess my um, thought is that, um, you know, it's in front of you. And if you would like to give direction for us to uh, talk about the Basalt Creek area and the um, issues that have been raised and talked about tonight, um, that is one direction. Um, and perhaps continuing it to a date certain so that we can answer the questions. This is specific about the Basalt Creek area and you already know that the master plan does not include the Basalt Creek area. Um, so my suggestion is much like what the uh, planning commission recommended and that is to adopt this PTA and perhaps give us direction to look at the Basalt Creek area and um, answer the questions that that have been raised and um, bring you back information about that about the Basalt Creek area but not to hang this up when you know it doesn't include the Basalt Creek area but it needs to be adopted. So I guess I have to go back because old Robert's thing. Uh, so Nancy, do you want to hold on that? Because I have, I see Councilor Pratt, his hand is up. Well, I, I'm happy to um, propose the first reading of uh, ordinance number 1453-21, provided that at the February 22nd meeting, we can have some resolution to the questions that were brought up this evening specific to Basalt Creek, which is not um, part of this PTA. All right, so I, I know we are, so you don't you, you have to remove, don't you have to withdraw your first motion? Yes, I'll withdraw my first motion to continue the hearing to a date certain. And I will replace that with a request for first reading by title only for uh, ordinance number 1453-21 with the proviso that we can have the Basalt Creek discussion at the earliest convenience of staff. Well, I got, Valerie, I got Councilor Pratt's hand up and I wanna ask Sean, is that something you can do? Yeah, so a couple things. So, so one, you're still in the hearing. 
So before you make a motion, there's got, you know, as far as the, uh, uh, if you're not going to continue it, there has to be a close of the, of the hear public hearing portion before you can enter into deliberations. And so that, that's the first step that would have to occur. Um, we, we can't condition uh, the, the, you know, first reading on something happening. So those are actually two different actions. So you have one action can be to, uh, you know, you can postpone it, you can advance it to a reading, or you could, uh, and then separately, there is an action to deal with whatever additional that's outside of what's before you on the, on the uh, PTA and, uh, and uh, tonight. Got it. Councilor Pratt. I'm fine with um, Sherilyn's suggestion. I do see these as two separate things. My concern is that these people get their questions answered and I don't, out of just transparency and being a good community. Right. So with that, I would do the technicality of, because I didn't, I closed the meeting. I can close the hearing, Sean, and then we move on to deliberation and potential vote. That's correct. Right. Yeah. If there's so no I, no more questions about the 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 you know the actual PTA itself or right. evidence. Right. So are there any more questions about the PTA? Council Brooks. My only question is um sep seeing them separately or not separately. My, the one concern I've got around that area is the part that is to Alton already and why there's not a plan when it's part of our city. Um, and so that goes into the question around postponing or um, moving forward. So um, I don't feel clear on it. So I'm kind of leaning towards postponing. So I'm gonna go back to the first part of your question about can staff address the question about uh, the plan not addressing parts of the city that are already annexed versus Salt Creek? Is, is that what your question was, Council Brooks, versus the second part? Yes. Yes. And the staff can chime in on this, but this is a, actually a 2019 master plan, and you annexed the Basalt Creek area in, in 2020. Um, and so that um, that those areas have come into Tualatin since the master since the Brown and Caldwell work was done. Does that answer your question, Council Brooks? Yeah, kind of. And I guess I have a follow up question. So some of my concern is, um, you know, we talked about they're supposed to be updated every ten years, and it was forty years. And so if we don't include it, are we anticipate, like how long does that take since we're not annexing things in? Um, you know, before we did this plan, I'm just curious, anticipatory wise, do we anticipate developing a plan for Basalt Creek that gets annexed in? Well, I think that it goes back to we didn't do it at this time. It doesn't mean there won't be one developed at some time, but you don't necessarily stop development plans and applications from coming in because we have the standards in place. All the requirements are there for stormwater regulations and rules and design. And uh, it doesn't mean that we wouldn't go back and do it as things um, present themselves with development challenges. Okay. And it takes like, like, like within years or within decades. I guess my question. I just have that question of time. Yeah, it could be done much quicker than the decades, of course. And I would think in years, especially as you start identifying projects, and this is a, you know, a hot area to develop. Then things will arise that you can turn your attention to and try to find is there a role for the city to play in that as far as capital projects and finding funding to do that? So it, it would be much quicker. It wouldn't have to wait for a 10 year update or longer. It could be as needed. You could open up um, the master plan and 
do an addendum for Basalt Creek, do the work with uh, Clean Water Services who, you know, they're the experts in stream uh, analysis and projects like that. So we could do something in partnership. That sounds good. Thank you very much. And I just want to be clear about, um, you know, I'm thinking through things and um, the updates help the environment a lot for the city that was in place when the plan was developed. And that's really important to me. Um, and that answer for me helps me out a lot, Kim. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So any other questions before I close the hearing? All right, so I'll go ahead and close the hearing and move on to uh, deliberations and or motions. So go well, ahead. I'll make a motion. <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm terrible at Zoom. Um, I will make a motion for first reading by title only for Ordinance number 1453-21 related to the PTA 21-0001. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I guess I uh, oh, Council Pratt, you seconded? Mm -hmm. Right. So I have a motion and a second to uh, for first reading by title, title only of ordinance number 1453-21. Any discussions on the motion? All right. So, Councillor Hillier. Aye. Councillor Pratt. Aye. Councillor Sacco. Aye. Councillor Brooks. Aye. Councillor Reyes. Yes. Council President Grimes. Aye. And I vote aye also. Sean. Sorry, I was still on mute. Ordinance number 1453-21, an ordinance relating to the stormwater master plan, amending the Tualatin Comprehensive Plan and amending Tualatin Development Code sections 74.630 and 74.640, PTA 21-0001. All right. Make a motion for a second reading by title only. I second it. Uh, I have a motion, a second. I think that was Councilor Hillier was seconding. All right. <laughs> uh, so, any discussion on that motion? Councilor Hillier? Aye. Councilor Pratt? Aye. Councilor Brooks? Aye. Councilor Reyes? Um, yes. Councilor Krasako. Aye. President Grimes. Aye. I vote aye also. It's unanimous. Sean. Ordin ordinance number 1453-21, an ordinance relating to the stormwater master plan, amending the Tualatin Comprehensive Plan, and amending Tualatin Development Code sections 74.630 and 74.640, PTA 21-0001. I'll make a motion to approve um, consideration of ordinance 1453-21. Do I have a second to approve ordinance 1453-21? Second. All right. I have a motion and a second to approve ordinance number 1453-21. Any discussion on that motion? I have a question on this. So I'm just curious around the piece um, that Kim brought up earlier around, um, around, is there any way we can put language around Basalt Creek into this motion? Uh, my suggestion would be that not here we can certainly direct staff to answer those five questions uh, outside of the PTA and bring that back to us. 
Well, answering the questions and then, but the other piece was about the concerns around just having a plan in the areas that are being incorporated into our city for people to feel comfortable. And that's my, my question around having some kind of piece in this that helps move that forward. I liked how Kim put it. I can't recall it because I'm not as brilliant as I'd like to be on TV, but especially at 8.30. But I'm just curious if that is a possibility or anything anybody else is interested in as well. Um, I just think that people, you know, that that's a big concern. Councilor Sacco. I think maybe what you're referring to, um, Councilor Brooks was having an, an appendix added afterwards. Um, I think that's, possibly the, um, the suggestion that she had. Um, and that's what stuck out to me. And I thought that was, um, you know, a great uh, solution for um, this conversation is to one, answer the questions, answer the five questions, and then um, separately uh, come up with um, an appendix that we could put on there that would include the new areas that are coming in so we can have it all encompassing at some point in the future. That's what I took away from it. Um, and that's what I would be, um, that's what I would like to see. That's exactly what I'd like to see too. All right. So we can certainly bring that up as soon as we uh, dispense with this business. We can, I can entertain a motion for that. Aye. All right. So uh, I have a motion and a second to adopt, I believe. Don't I, Sean? Yes. <laughs> All right. So I got to go through the roll. Uh, Councilor Hillier. Aye. Uh, Councilor Pratt? Aye. Councilor Brooks? Aye. Councilor Reyes? Um, I have my hand up because I wanted to clarify what I'm voting on. It's uh, This is to make yeah. sure that there's a, uh, I really like what uh, Councilor Brooks is suggesting and what um, Councilor Rosaco kind of reiterated. So is that what we're working on, we're voting on right now? No, we're, we're voting on the PTA. And the PTO. That's that after the PTA. Okay. Then, uh, yeah. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Sacco. Aye. Councilor President Grimes. Aye. And the chair votes aye also, so it's unanimous. So now uh, Council Brooks could make that motion if she'd like. Yes, I'd like to move, make a motion to um, add an appendix for future planning of Basalt Creek. Second. Any discussion on that motion? So, so just, just to clarify, I apologize, but so the, the way this will work is, is it's directing staff to uh, essentially go back and do a new uh, portion of the master plan. Staff would then bring that back through this same process, a plan text amendment process to, uh, for the comprehensive plan. And then that that would be represented as essentially an addendum piece to uh, the master plan. Thank you. All right. Okay. Anybody have questions with what Sean said? Okay. So I, I forget where I was at. So I had a motion. Was there a second? Yes. All right. So I have a motion and a second to uh, add an addendum or annex, if you will, or whatever, to the uh, master plan that addresses Basalt Creek. I'm totally shrinking that down. <laughs> uh, do I have that correct, Council Brooks? Yes, it's an appendix that turns into an addendum that will be presented in the future. So we're directing staff, like Sean said. All right. Any discussion on those motions? All right. I Would that you. include answering all those questions, the five, five, six questions that are out there? That's on the other, on when we meet afterwards, right? I think that's a separate thing. Oh, okay. Never mind. Right. Councilor Hurley, you had, your, <laughs> you had your hand up and you got the questioning look now. <laughs> so um, I had the same, a uh, similar question to Councilor Reyes. So, if we're going to do that, are we? We're not going to incorporate the answers to the five questions. Are they going to only go back to the Lucini family? Are they going to come back to us so that we can be able to 
understand and potentially look at the, so I'm not, anyway, I'm not sure what the addendum is gonna, what good it will do at this point when we don't know what the answers to those things are. I guess that seems to be putting the cart before the horse and Sherilyn has been had her finger up for quite a while, Mayor. Yep, go ahead, Sherilyn. Well, maybe, my, maybe the suggestion could be to, um, to direct staff to come back on either February 22nd or March the 8th. I'm not sure how long it will take us uh, to um, address the questions, the five questions, and agendize a, a discussion about what to do about future planning areas. And so that would give you a time to, that would give you a chance to understand the answers to the questions and then give cogent direction about you know, we'll be able to lay out in the staff report kind of what your options are um, about this addendum to the master plan and what that process would look like along with the, the answers to these questions. As opposed to, you know, kind of making it up on the fly tonight and um, when I'm not sure we all understand what goes into that. And uh, I mean, I'm not sure I do. So it would, I think it would be helpful to let us regroup and to come back with an agenda item on um, in the closest possible uh, with the answers to the questions, along with some options about how to address the concerns we've heard from you about a, doing an addendum for future planning areas, including Salt Creek. I, I, I just, presented it separately. I didn't anticipate that those questions wouldn't be answered, but I think that having it um, as an appendix, agreed upon appendix tonight is where I'm at um, because it's it's concerning and I don't think I don't think we have to race to when it would be brought back to us. We can have a discussion about the questions and um, flush out what that appendix looks like, but that we want to look at from my perspective that we want to look at how how we're um how we're planning for that area that's the future of our city so would you entertain a suggestion from the city manager on the process versus what you're suggesting i i'm i I guess I don't see the difference so much, except for that we have an agreement around the um, creating the appendix and um, that we're committed to doing that. So to me, I'm still committed, um, but I'd still like to keep my motion on the floor. All right, Councilor Pratt. I'm wondering if, um... We could vote tonight to add an addendum and then Cheryl and could come back and we could discuss what we want and what we want that to look like and what does that make sense? <laughs> that's, where that's where I'm at too. But I don't know if that if if that's what Cheryl was trying to say or uh, I'm a little unclear on um I guess well, I'm looking at Kim sort of uh to uh, for some direction on um, I don't know what all goes into it, uh, and I was kind of conflating both things of answering the question and giving you options for uh, laying out the process for doing an addendum, but I, I, I'll look at Kim. Yeah, I, yes, I'm thinking, I don't know on the fly either what all will go into doing this Basalt Creek area study or analysis. So I would like to come back better prepared after talking to our um, consultant, Brown, at Brown and Caldwell, talking to Clean Water Services and, you know, coming up with, and staff and, you know, determining what an addendum might look like. What can we um, present back to you as some, I guess, pathways to address this? And I think that's where Sherilyn was going is, you know, we could take a really high level look, we could take a more in-depth look. So what, what would that look like for council? And then you could direct us even further, but at this point, directing us to prepare, I guess, some ideas on how to 
do an addendum for Basalt Creek would be great. And um, we could come back because I, I, I think there might be a couple of different ways to slice it and we want to make sure you have your options. Well, that's what I thought my motion was, was to come back and prepare some options for an addendum for Basalt Creek. And that, that's what I was. Can, yeah, can I just say that, you know, our consultant is not sure how a future appendix is going to benefit the plan itself. Um, let's see what else she has to say at this point. And outstanding data needs to address the area at a CIP scale. So um, she's got an idea that we could adopt the master plan as it is with the intent to conduct a basin planning effort specific for Basalt Creek. A new CIP could be added to the master plan authorizing funds to dedicate for a basin planning effort. So that's from Angela, who's our consultant and she's watching the meeting tonight. Thank you, Angela. But maybe that's what we do is we address the basin in the addendum. Which just to add, I think is, is answers one of the five questions that are in the questions. And so in order to answer those five questions, we do need to have some high level answer to that question to come back to you, Council. Council Sacco. Um, I think it, it sounds fair to give staff enough time and do the research justice um, and give us all the information we need to understand how to move forward. And I think it's our responsibility as elected officials then to not lose sight of um, you know, what we're asking for and make sure that we bring this up in future meetings as we have the information um, given to us to proceed with an addendum um, if, that's the, if that's what we wish. Um, but I really think it's up to us not to lose sight of that after we have the information that is going um, to be provided to us um, at a future time. All right. So what I would ask is Councilor Brooks to maybe rephrase her, if she wants to, not, I'm not telling you to do it. <laughs> if she wants to rephrase your motion because you, the impression I got, I think like Council City Manager did, is you wanted an addendum done right away. I. Um, but it sounds like you're amenable to the approach that the city manager had, but you wanted to keep it on the radar about possibly doing an addendum, but giving staff time to regroup, answer the five questions and give us some uh, options on what an ordinance, I'm sorry, what an uh, amendment process might be to the master plan. Okay, I'll rephrase. Um, I withdraw my motion and, um, and I make a motion to ask staff to answer the five questions and come back with some proposed addendum ideas for Basalt Creek. Uh, addendum ideas or addendum approaches? Approaches. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so I got a motion on that. Second. I have a motion and second on Council Brooks's uh, motion to uh, have staff answer the five questions as best as possible at this time, and then have uh, staff come back to us with some suggestions on the amendment process to the master plan that addresses Basalt Creek issues. That's not, is that correct? Did I get it? All right. <laughs> so, Councillor Hilliard. Um, aye. Uh, Councillor Pratt. Aye. Councilor Brooks. Aye. Councilor Reyes. Aye. Councilor Sacco. Aye. Councilor President Grimes. Aye. And I vote aye also. Thank you. All right. So that's it. We got everything on this item, I believe. All right. I, I'm looking for Sean's head to nod. He nodded. <laughs> All right, so moving on to general business. Uh, item one, consideration of resolution number 5341-21, declaring certain private property necessary to acquire in order to construct the Martin Ozzie Avenue and Saga Street intersection improvement project. I see Jeff, you leading this one, Jeff? I am leading this one uh, with Sean's help, a lot of help from Sean. So uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. 
Uh, tonight, we are here to ask for your consideration of resolution number 5341-21, declaring certain private property necessary to acquire in order to construct the Martin Assey Avenue and Saggard Street intersection improvement project. Um, I didn't say that as fast as Sean, but I'll catch up someday. So, uh, so I'm gonna walk through a, I'm gonna share screens with you, and then I'm gonna walk through a presentation um, similar to uh, one that we've talked about before. Uh, but specific to this issue. Bear with me for just a second. All right, is that visible? Great. Uh, so again, tonight we're talking about the property acquisition for the Martinez Sagar project. And let me see if I can get this. There we go. I want to be able to see you all when I'm talking as much as I can. Um, so this project, uh, Martin Ezzy Saggart uh, Intersection Improvement Project, fixes the worst intersection in Tualatin, one of the worst intersections in Tualatin. So you can see from this photo, this is, uh, again, just a, a, a Earth View photo from Google. And you can, this is just a typical day at this intersection, kind of chaos and craziness. And so uh, this project installs a signal, uh, adds new bike lanes, adds new sidewalks, curb ramps, and crosswalks, uh, and then also uh, improves crosswalks at Martin Azzi and Mohawk. Uh, the plan is for construction this summer. Um, and of course, uh, the schedule for construction depends on property acquisition. Uh, so this image shows the uh, the property uh, that we need for this project uh, that we're talking about tonight. So we need to purchase property from tax lot uh, 2S125BB00100 in order to construct the project. Um, this is uh, owned by the Kearns. We need a, con a temporary construction easement of 2,609 square feet. Uh, and then we need to purchase permanent right-of-way of uh, 2,531 square feet. Uh, and so uh, it's not shown on this, uh, this image specifically, but we need that property in order to uh, build the sidewalk, the bike lanes, and uh, do some grading during construction and access the back of the sidewalk during construction. So the temporary construction easements, uh, again, that just allows us to get in, do the work, uh, and then grade the, the site back. So basically match in from the new back of sidewalk up to the existing grade. Uh, and then the right-of-way acquisition along Sagar Street allows us to widen the bike lane, sidewalk, um, and install a new traffic signal pole. And so the current property, this purchase is necessary in order to construct this project. Um, we've done a bunch of work to date, so we hired U uh, Universal Field Services to represent us. Uh, they started talking with the property owners in August. Um, we identified the property needs based on design criteria uh, and the, the amount of space that we need to install those, those facilities. Uh, we had our consultants prepare an appraisal for the property, uh, for the acquisition and the easement. And then uh, back in August, we shared that with the property owner. Um, we started negotiating uh, with the property owner to uh, find a proposal that might work for both of us. Uh, and then uh, we sent a final proposal about two weeks ago to the property owner, uh, kind of with our sort of our best proposal at the time to try and uh, get to a place where we could all agree uh, to do this. Hey, Sean, do you want to? This is. Definitely your area. <laughs> yes. So thank you, Jeff. So uh, before you tonight is uh, a resolution of necessity, and this is part of the uh, condemnation process, and which is a very statutory process. So it's governed by by laws. But what this resolution does tonight is authorize the city the city to continue to negotiate and seek agreement with the property owner. So just because you pass the resolution doesn't prevent the city from trying to uh, come to agreement before filing for condemnation. However, the city um, and the city will continue to do that and continue to try to purchase that property by agreement. However, what the resolution does is if agreement cannot be made or reached with the property owner, it does authorize the city to 
uh, acquire through condemnation uh, the, the right of way strip as well as the temporary construction easement. So with that acquisition would be uh, about 2,500 square feet of right of way, 2,531. And then uh, the temporary construction easement would uh, allow for that access for just that portion that we need. And there's an expiration date attached to that. And then it would revert back to the property owner after the city is, is done with the construction. Um, so tonight, uh, that authorization, uh, as part of that process, the city, if you authorize the resolution, the next step would be for the city to issue a 40-day offer letter to the property owner. With that, the property owner gets a copy of the city's appraisal for the property. And again, it's not the whole property, it's just these strips that, that we're looking at. Um, and then if the city and the property owner cannot come to an agreement, then this would authorize not only the filing of the condemnation, but anything the city needs to acquire what's known as immediate possession. So the process that that, that entails is the city filing certain legal documents in court, as well as paying to the court uh, to hold uh, the money that, that is authorized. And then the legal fight occurs after that if, the, if needed. Uh, but that would allow the city to proceed with the construction of this, uh, of this needed improvement. All right, that probably should say questions and discussion, but uh, we jumped the gun and said, thank you, so. <laughs> So can, thank you. Questions for Sean and or Jeff. Council Pratt. So if we pass this resolution tonight, you would make a 40 day offer and then after the 40 days, if an agreement wasn't come to, then you would start the condemnation process. Is that the timing of this? That, that's the timing. It, it doesn't, uh, we, we, by statute, we have to issue a 40 day offer before we go to condemnation in court. So uh, again, we, we have an offer already that's that's been uh, given to the property owner. So there may be some give and, give and take through that process already. Um, but if not, the next step is to have a 40 day offer with that appraisal. And then my, my second question is um, under the resolution, it um, talks about the home run rule with uh, the um easement part, the temporary easement, but does that also apply the um, best public you know, but good and least injury? Does that also apply to the part we would be taking for permanently? So, so yeah, so those are those are the uh, the legal basis for the actions that the council is taking. And so uh, the one is is to take completely as right of way. Um, that strip. And then separately, there's a, the other strip that's just being taken temporarily for construction. And then once that construction is done, it would revert back to the property owner. Okay, thank you. Other questions? I have a clarification. Sure. I just want to hear it said, um, I believe we spoke about this in another meeting. Um, prior, but the temporary construction easement, the 2,600 odd square feet, um, that is temporary. And when it is returned back to the property owner, it is in the same condition that we give it back in the same condition that we took it as, or is do we give it back even better than we took it? would be my question. If I'm, I, I realize I'm probably not phrasing that quite correctly, but. Sure. So whenever we, uh, when we finish construction, we regrade the site to make it smooth. Um, and then uh, plant it back, it's currently planted with grass. And so we would plant it back with grass similar to what is there today. Okay. So there would be no no harm or damage to the property owner or the value of the piece of property after we temporarily use it and then return it to him. Right. All right, thank you. I, I would just add that that value is all factored into the condemnation process. So whatever value those, uh, you know, the temporary 
access of that strip has a particular value that would uh, be, if it went to condemnation, would be subject to that, that condemnation process. Other questions? All right. So with no questions, do we have any motions? I'll make a motion. Oh, sorry. I was going to try to do this for the first time. Um, I make a motion to adopt resolution number 5341-21. Right. Did I do that right? I'll yes, I'll keep that. I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution number 5341-21. Any discussion on those motions? All right. Seeing no hands up, Councillor Hillier. Aye. Councilor Pratt. Didn't hear you, Valerie. Aye. Councillor Sacco. Aye. Councilor Reyes. Yes. Councilor Brooks. Aye. Council President Grimes. Aye. And I vote aye also. That's unanimous. Thank you. All right. So moving on to items removed from consent. We had none tonight. Uh, then what, that moves us into any council communications for this evening. All right. Seeing none, do I have a motion for adjournment, knowing that we have another meeting after this? <laughs> I move to adjourn. Second. So I have a motion and a second to adjourn the Tualatin City Council meeting of February 8th. All those in favor, just raise your hand and say aye. Yes. <laughs> All right. So let me switch screens here. I'll now call into order the February 8th uh, Tualatin Development Commission meeting. Uh, welcome everyone. And we have just a few items on here tonight. Uh, first thing is public comment. Uh, public comment is the opportunity for anyone to address the commission on anything that is not on the agenda tonight. Uh, please limit those questions or comments to about three minutes. Uh, do we have anyone at the poll center, Mr. Russell? Uh, negative, Mayor. All right. Anyone in the Zoom meeting would like to have some public comment to the commission? Not see any. All right. Next thing we have is our consent agenda. The consent agenda are items that are considered routine. They wrote it on in one uh, swell swoop. Um, and uh, we have one item here in the consent agenda for the commission. It's item number one, consideration of approval of the Tualatin Development Commission meeting minutes of December 14th, 2020. Would any counselor like this removed from the consent? I see none. I make a motion. motion to approve the minutes. I have a motion. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Uh, Councilor Hillier, I mean, Commissioner Hillier. Thank you, you Commissioner. <laughs> Wasn't there, but uh, I assume they're fine. Aye. Commissioner Pratt. Aye. Commissioner Sacco. Aye. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Brooks. Aye. Commissioner Grimes. Aye. Would I also. Moving on to special reports. Item number one, Leviton Tax Increment Finance District Proposal Projects. And I think this is Jonathan. Good evening, Chair. Chair, I was going to merge Chair and Mayor together in that one word, but good evening, Chair and uh, members of the Commission. So tonight, uh, staff is pleased to present to you um, some recommendations on potential projects that we have been uh, working for for the last two years. Um, as you know, two years ago, uh, at the time, council had the education series. 
in which recently staff provided an introductory memo to our new commissioners about what urban renewal efforts are going on. And by the way, for the general public, as well as everyone else, it's on Tualatin.gov. So we're being very open and transparent about this process. So in 2018, a city council had four education sessions regarding urban renewal. And one of the key priorities that council identified in addition to some uh, feasibility studies is to understand what to do with the Leventon Tax Increment District to spend those funds and then ultimately close down the district. So tonight after two years of work and also kind of being creative with uh, um, existing city projects and departments, we're pleased to present this. So tonight, um, the question for the commission will be, do you support the proposed project list for the Leventon Tax Increment District? And just to clarify and so refresh, the map to the right is what uh, Leventon looks like today. Um, it is primarily uh, where LAM, uh, JAE is located as well as the Cherry Stem down 124th. So earlier in November of last year, uh, the goal is to amend the plan document to expand the remaining funds on identified projects. And I'll kind of get into the synopsis of what the approach that we have to take if council, or excuse me, if the commission is looking to go down this path. So just real quick for both existing and new commissioners, I want to provide a brief background of where we've been in Leventon. So right off the bat, I have to say that Leventon is used as a best example case study for urban renewal in Oregon in terms of greenfield development. So with that being said, it was established in 1985. Um, and then between uh, 1985 and the year that it was closed down is 2010. Uh, $251 million in increased property value for the entire district. And so the reason that that's beneficial is at the time it was valued at 33.7 million. Um, in that increment, after the uh, closure of the district, it gets dispersed to all taxing districts. So it's a very beneficial tool that benefits the taxing districts in the long term. Uh, like I said, it ceased collection of tax increment in 2010, but the district was not closed down, uh, unlike Curd, which we closed down uh, last year. Um, the last project that was completed in 20, was in 2018, and that was the observance of some wetland mitigation off of 124th. Um, in 2019, City Council, or as acting as the commission as well, directed staff to terminate the district and identify projects. Uh, Right now, the Leventon Tax Increment District has roughly $3.4 million in remaining fund balance. And before we close the district, uh, we must expend all remaining uh, before it's closed. And per our consultant, uh, this does not count towards our total district allowance for future feasibility studies. So because this is a non-tax collecting district, this is just a um, what you would say a remainder of the 1985 passage. So without further ado, um, I also want to say that council in 2019 directed staff to also talk to uh, existing and area businesses about what the needs were. And in your staff report, you'll notice that the two top were transportation and mobility. Now they didn't specific address specific projects, but that was just their concern overall. So with $3.4 million and working across planning, engineering, uh, public works, city management and finance, we've come up with two solutions. Both will be going on in tandem. So we have a minor amendment process and a substantial. Uh, the minor amendment, as you noted in 2020, uh, urban renewal planning was a priority. And that we've allocated $400,000 because we do not know exactly the capacity of what council, or excuse me, the commission is looking for in terms of district two. So we wanna be able to make sure that we have plenty of wiggle room for the needs that in district two, which is the Northern district. And then per um, the mobility issues that the commission, and then also acting as the council has prioritized the safe crosswalks, we're proposing a rapid crosswalk beacon of $70,000 at the um, 108th and Tualatin Road, which is near um, Leventon. And then the substantial amendment, and I'll get into that in a second, is a plan extension, which is $25,000. And I think everyone's pretty familiar with this project is the Herman Road Extension Project 
um, with 2.9 million. So what is a minor amendment process? Uh, it's a simple project addition to an existing plan in accordance with the plan document. And these two plans are in accordance with that document. So it's gonna be a very simple process. We have an anticipated completion date of March, 2021. And the only requirements that are need to be made is a resolution by this commission. So I've got, and also in your staff report, just kind of a brief synopsis of what those projects are, but future urban renewal planning and then rapid crosswalk beacons. This is where it gets just a little bit more complex, but not hard. So the substantial amendment process is basically anything that's not a minor amendment. An expansion of a district by more than 1% from its original plan. In um, 1989, we added 33.3 acres to the Leventon Tax Increment District. And so that automatically eliminated our minor amendment process. So no matter what we do for the district, we'll have to go uh, with the substantial amendment process if we include anything outside the district. Uh, the anticipated completion date is October 2021. And this is a multi-step process ending with the city council adoption. So it has to go through the commission, a public hearing, a consult and confer with the affected tax in, uh, districts, which according to our consultant, Elaine Howard, will be a very simple process because it's not a um, tax issue. And then a required 45 day consult and confer with a public hearing. Um, and so, as I was saying in the previous two slides ago, it's the expansion of the district. So we'll have to expand it if we wanna include this project up through Herman Road towards the project of where it's been identified. And the reason that there's about 25,000 is we have to do legal amendments to the plan document, which requires surveying and filing for uh, deed processes. And then um, the addition of the Herman Road project, which uh, is currently underway in design. So it's going to add a sidewalk and path on the north side. And the reason that I'm gonna be very tentative, there are four options right now being considered by staff for the best possible approach. So, but this is a um, kind of a tentative what you would expect for this project. So a sidewalk um, and path on the north side, bike lanes, fix the drainage issues and add a center turn lane and the industrial driveway. Um, and like I said, it's currently funded through preliminary design. And so I'm going to move into the next steps, but I'll leave questions and answers in a second. Um, the next 60 day milestones is if the commission is in support of this project plan list, we'll have a project plan minor amendment approval by the end of March, and then we'll amend our contract with Elaine Howard for the uh, amendment excuse me, for the contract for the substantial amendment. And just to recap, you know, the question being proposed by staff is, do you support this project list? And um, I will leave that open for discussions. So question. I feel like I blew through there, Chair. <laughs> that was good, I liked it. It was like, all right, uh, questions. I see Councilor Pratt's hand is up. Oh, hi, Jonathan. Um, well, I'm kind of just curious who thought of the Herman Road thing, because I think it's brilliant and we can get those improvements done. But I also wondered um, if that were to happen, then at what point does this district close after those projects are completed or before then? So, yeah, it would be completed as soon as the last taxing documents are filed with both the state and the county. Um, and kind of like what we did with Kerr, just to kind of refresh, when we moved the properties that were owned by the TDC to the city uh, ownership <clears throat> and moved that into the TDC administrative fund, we were able to close. Okay, Councilor Brooks. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Jonathan, and and thanks for all the work that you've done this year for the city and for, especially during COVID. Um, I just appreciate your leadership. My question is kind of random. Um, there's a, and I, I don't, I, it sounds like a great idea to me. Um, there is like a handmade sign down there for deer crossing. 
And I'm just wondering if there's any way that we can actually get a real deer crossing sign in this project through this, if that's in our city purview or does that go through the state or what, or the county or what? <laughs> so I'm not too familiar with the sign being referenced, but- uh, I made a handmade deer crossing sign on Twelton Road, very close to where you're talking about where deer cross down to get to the river from that campus. And it looks like, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, no. Go oh, ahead. It looks like Jeff Fox dropped off um, from the previous discussion, but I, I made a note of it and um, uh, signs are through uh, street signs. So uh, that goes through his department and, okay. and the rapid flashing beacon will go through his department. So okay. like, I just I thought of it since we were doing this area, so I just would love to see that happen so that whoever that kid is that made the sign could get a real sign. Thanks. Other questions for Jonathan? Commissioner Faco. Thank you. Um, I think this might be assumed, but I just wanted to clarify the funds that we have take care of the project 100%. Is that correct? Uh, with all four options being considered, yes, it would it would cover all, uh, with maybe fifty thousand left over. Are you asking, Councilor Saka, the Herman Road project? Does this get that fully constructed? Correct. Yes, I believe it does. Thank it you. Gets it fully constructed. Other questions? All right. Sorry, it's quick, but don't you have, doesn't this district have to be audited each year at a tune of $10,000? So that'll use up your money. <laughs> Left over. All right, so Jonathan, you need a formal vote or approval of the projects. What are you looking for? I don't think I need a full vote, but if, if the commission is in, um, in agreement with this proposal, then we'll move forward with the necessary documents. And just so you know, um, in terms of implementation, what this commission will do is just contract with the city. So it'll be a very simple, um, just paper transfer. So nothing on the city side changes how that is implemented. This commission will just be uh, contracting with the city. All right. So is there any agreement? All commissioners okay with the suggested project plan? All thumbs up. All right. So moving on to general business, item number one, Urban Renewal District 1, Basalt Creek Task Force Appointments. Uh, so the resolution before you tonight is to appoint five members uh, to the District 1. Uh, sorry, I'm drawing a blank. That went, the prior one went so well, it just kind of surprised me. So. The resolution before you tonight is to appoint five members to the District 1 Task Force, which you authorized both in December and again in January. And this meets the best practices requirement of what we want to include in public comment. Um, we're still trying to find two additional property owners uh, to meet that seven member threshold, but the first meeting doesn't occur until the third week of March. So I, I feel pretty confident that we can meet that requirement. In order to, and then if we do find those, we'll just bring back a, an additional resolution for those. But if you have questions about those participants, I'll be more than happy to answer those questions. Any questions from Jonathan on the appointments? Mm -hmm. Sorry, two things. Um, the the recommendation, and maybe you covered this, Jonathan, and I just missed it. But the recommendation originally. Um, was that it be at least one taxing entity so we reach or overlapping taxing entity so we reached out to Twilight and Valley Fire and Rescue and they have suggested Cassandra Olvin uh, to be on the on the, the task force uh, who's a great choice and then uh, secondly we would like a, um, a city council member oh so the planning commission also uh, recommended I believe um, there's a name there from the planning commission and then you guys appoint uh, one um, uh, member as a representative of the city council. 
right? Council Pratt. I make a um, recommendation for city councilor to appoint. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'd like to um, recommend Kristen Sacco because she lives there and the, there are a lot of issues that she's concerned about that will be taking place in that area. Second. All right. Um, first, we've got to approve the resolution, then we can. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we, we the insert, uh, uh, unless there's other nominations of floor, that'd be uh, Commissioner Sacco slash Councilor Sacco representing the city council on the uh, development commission on the urban renewal district one task force. All right. So I have a motion to approve resolution 623-20. So moved. Second. I have a motion a second to approve resolution 623-20. Any discussions on the motion? Councilor Hill, I'm oh, sorry, Commissioner Hillier. Aye. Commissioner Pratt. Aye. Commissioner Grimes. Aye. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Brooks. Aye. Commissioner Sacco. Aye. All right. So circling back to the nomination of Councilor slash Commissioner Sacco for the City Council representative, uh, are there any other nominations on the floor? Uh, I guess uh, John says we saw the vote, so we'll vote. <laughs> so uh, Commissioner Sacco slash Council Sacco to be representative on the Twalton uh, as for the Twalton City Council on the uh, Urban Renewal District One Task Force. Uh, Councilor Commissioner Hillier. Aye. Commissioner Pratt. Aye. Commissioner Grimes. Thank you for doing this. Um, Commissioner Sacco, aye. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Brooks. Aye. Commissioner Sacco. Aye. And I vote aye also. Congratulations. Unanimous. All right. So let me scroll back to the top. Uh, that was the only item of business and general business. Uh, there's no council roundtable, commissioner roundtable here. So I'll ask for a motion for adjournment. So moved. I move to commission meeting. Who wants a second? Second. Right. <laughs> I have a motion and a second to adjourn the February 8th to Alton Development Commission meeting. All the favors say aye with their hands up. Aye. Aye. <laughs> Thank you all. Good evening. Have a good night.